hello everyone and thanks for all the fish. So, I wanted to expand a bit on some comments I made in a previous video talking about a simulated universe and how that would affect the problem of evil in theism. These thoughts didn't come out of nowhere. I mean, clearly I have recently been digging into AI and seeing what it can do, so that part was already on my mind. But more to the point, before I got suspended from Twitter, I was involved in an exchange with an atheist who started off the discussion by claiming that I was irrational since, as a theist, I believed in God despite the existence of evil. I want to emphasize this bit again. He started off by calling me irrational or illogical. I don't remember now the exact word. It was one or the other. The reason I emphasize that claim he made is because after about 10 hours of back and forth, not a straight 10 hours, as this was over the course of a day of tweets here and there, but after a combined total of 10 hours of discussion, I pointed out that the atheist himself was illogical and his response was, quote, logic has nothing to do with this. So it turns out an atheist will go from saying, you're illogical for believing this, to logic has nothing to do with this in roughly 10 hours, but the important question is, how did we get to that point? It started simply enough. I pointed out that if you were going to make the claim that theism is illogical based on the problem of evil, then you would need to establish this claim in one of two ways. Either this is a problem internal to theism, or it is an external problem. Now what do I mean by that? Well, an internal problem would mean that if you take the definition of morality supplied by theists and apply it to God, you would get a contradiction. For instance, theists claim that God is morally good, but if it is shown that under theistic standards God would be morally evil, that is an internal critique of theism. But it turns out it is very difficult to establish this, because theists aren't morons. We aren't stupid. We have thought about these issues and, consequently, have put forth consistent definitions of morality which result in God still being good even when evil occurs. Now, an atheist still might not accept these definitions as being valid. He or she may even think they are ad hoc. That doesn't matter from the perspective of an internal critique. If the internal logic of theism isn't self-contradictory, then you haven't established an internal critique of theism. But that still leaves the second branch. You can still provide an external critique of theism, and that is the method this atheist took. He insisted that there were certain actions which were evil for God to take regardless of God's own definitions of moral and immoral. I asked for what this position was, and then gave an internal critique of those proposed standards by showing how, if they were true, they would lead to moral chaos. It was for that reason that the atheist eventually concluded that logic had nothing to do with morality. The basic principle proposed by the atheist in this instance is a familiar one if you've been in philosophical debates before. The moral standard is that we must seek to minimize pain and maximize happiness for as many as possible. Now, I don't want to go into the various responses I made to this at the time, although if there's interest in the comments let me know. I can always do another video essay on the topic. Instead of that, the reason I brought it up is to link this sort of thinking back to the concept of reality being part of a simulation. Again, I am a dualist so I do not believe that the mind is just what a brain does, but instead exists separately, but intertwined with the physical structure of the brain itself. Incidentally, I am not just a spiritualist when it comes to the mind either. I think that's why Christianity has a doctrine of resurrection. Everyone is resurrected at the end, because in a spiritual form we are not complete beings. We need both our physical bodies and our spiritual aspects to be a complete human soul. But again, that is not the point of this video. Rather, assuming materialism is true and assuming that dualism is false, then I ask what effect that has on morality. Because if it is the case that the mind just comes about from physical actions, I think it is fairly clear that we have already created those sorts of physical reactions that would constitute, at least minimally, the concept of a mind. Now I need to be very clear in what I am saying here, because it's easy for us to fall into misconceptions. We've played simulation games before, it's why I've used footage of simulations in these videos. But what I'm showing on the screen here is not, in fact, what a mind created inside computer hardware would be experiencing, any more than the wavelengths produced on an electroencephalograph are what the brain is actually thinking of in a human. Sure, it may be possible to associate certain frequencies with certain thoughts, sensations, emotions, and the like. But my computer is not aware of what the image on the screen that I am currently looking at actually is, any more than your individual neurons are aware of what your skin color is or the exact position of your hand now. And this is the point, neurons are not very complex on the cellular level, or to speak of it from a physics perspective, from an atomic level, all matter is made up of the same bits. Hydrogen is made of protons and electrons, each of which is interchangeable with the electrons and protons in, say, sodium. That is, you can take an electron from a sodium atom, stick it to a hydrogen atom, take the electron that was on the hydrogen atom and stick it back on the sodium atom, and chemistry would continue just as before. In the same way, you could swap neurons and the brain wouldn't be affected. And, to get to a computer, you can do the same with computer circuits. The physics is interchangeable. There's no such thing as an electron that belongs to the mitochondria in a specific neuron in my skull, but the shape and arrangement of those pieces is what is relevant. If the mind only exists because of that form, then if the exact same form itself exists anywhere, the exact same mind would result. 
That doesn't mean the identical mind would see the same thing at the same time, because the location of the different minds would be different, both in space and in time. But suppose I were to travel to New York City and watch a Broadway show today, which would result in me having a specific emotional response to the show I'm watching. If I remain here in Colorado, but an exact duplicate of my mind was instead transported to New York City and it saw that show, it would have the response I would have had if I had gone myself and that duplicate of my own mind would have no way of knowing that it was not the real me. So if the physical structure is all that matters for that, then this type of copying would be possible and, as I argued in my last video, is actually more likely than not to be the case, predicated on the assumption that dualism is false. But whereas before I only talked about an instance of me being copied from a biological entity, the reality is that the structure of a mind could be created with minor variations such that the mind that was created never had any correlation to a physical brain at all. It could exist solely in a virtual world, just as a pattern that happens to have the right shape to form a mind. Now, when we are dealing with questions of morality, how does one apply the standard of maximizing happiness and minimizing suffering in this scenario? Does a mind that doesn't actually exist physically, but one that does exist virtually, one that experiences what it thinks to be lost, even though nothing it experienced was ever real to begin with, does that have an impact on what is moral or immoral? If a completely virtual mind is created and that completely virtual mind experiences a horrific death, has that increased the pain and suffering in the universe? Or does the fact that nothing existed outside of a pattern on a computer chip mean that there was never anything moral about any of it to begin with? Because, and here's the kicker, what difference does it make if the mind comes about from the pattern of atoms in a cell or because of the pattern of circuits in a computer chip? Why is one mind considered better or worse? Or, more importantly, why is one mind considered more real than another? It seems to me that, if dualism is false, then the existence of these mind structures would at the very least potentially be causing actual pain. But even more important than that, we have no way of knowing what actual structures exist to generate these minds or what such minds are capable of feeling in the first place. If we take a neural network of the brain as an example, clearly it's an object that's not all that massive in the grand scheme of things. It literally fits inside a human skull. But let's set that aside. I'm looking to my left at one of my cats eating his food right now. His entire skull is less than the size of my fist. I know this because he likes to do soft headbutts, and sometimes I'll put out my fist and let him push into it. So his brain is smaller than my fist, yet clearly he can feel pain. If I step on his tail, he will yowl at me. He was attacked by a raccoon once and had a gash on his forehead that hurt him for weeks afterward. You would not be able to see, just from examining his brain, what the exact pattern needed for him to experience pain is, but it's in a tiny area smaller than my hand. So, who's to say that our computers that we already have aren't subjectively feeling agony right now? Hold up. I want you to actually think about this, because the implications are profound. If self-awareness, self-consciousness, the ability to experience pain or other sensations, if those genuinely are just based on the pattern or structure of physical objects, then how do we know we haven't already created that in a physical form already? How do we know that our espresso machine isn't undergoing severe torture every time we turn it on? Sure, a machine doesn't react the way that living organisms do, but then it lacks the ability to do so in the first place. And I don't think that matters to the average person anyway. If bacteria felt pain, I don't think it would stop us from using penicillin to kill as much of it as we could to keep ourselves from having a runny nose. Now, I ask again, if morality is minimizing suffering, and if it is the case that our own technology may be maximizing suffering for some beings, not humans, but some form of minds that can experience pain, then is what we are doing at any time actually good or evil? If we maximize human pleasure by creating technology that lets us play video games or watch YouTube videos, and it comes at the cost of the suffering of a mind that we cannot even begin to fathom since it's arising out of the functioning of electronic circuits in a computer, then are we increasing or decreasing the amount of suffering in the universe? Can we even know the answer to that question? I don't think we can, which is part of why I find it to be an insufficient definition of morality. And I want to be clear on this, because it's easy to confuse the levels I am discussing. When I talk about a computer being conscious, you're probably thinking of the hardware being similar to the head and the workings inside of it to be the brain. But no, just as the neurons that happen in our brain do what they do for strictly biological reasons following strict rules of physics and chemistry and they have no idea what the meaning of their signals are, they only know to send out a signal if a specific threshold is reached, so too, the hardware of a computer would act. And just as the mind experiences itself as separate from the neurons in your brain, where you can perceive the sensations of your toes, of your heart and stomach, and of your eyes, but you cannot sense the sensations of your neurons, that would also be an analogy of the mind of the computer. Just as cancer can rewrite the reproduction routine of a cell in your body such that your own body turns against you, it's possible that we could program a computer in such a manner that the mind generated from that computer has no idea why, but suddenly it is depressed. Again, I ask, is there anyone who would consider that action to be evil on our part? 
we cannot interface directly with neurons. We cannot ask individual neurons if they would prefer we think about kittens or tulips. We only know how we subjectively feel. Why would we expect other minds to be any different? And when we consider my cat again, I cannot even understand how he sees the world. Yet I am supposed to think that if we create a mind in a machine that we would be able to instantly recognize that it's actually thinking and isn't experiencing pain, or existential angst, or a crisis of fate. These are all relatively new questions for atheists to ponder, but the reality is that these questions have been around far longer for theists, because while atheists are only just now catching up to the possibility of a simulated universe where these things could potentially be relevant, theists have wrestled for centuries with similar questions. Questions like, suppose that God is able to pick and choose what reality to instantiate, but in order to do so he first thinks through all the possible counterfactuals of reality. Since he is able to imagine you perfectly in each of those hypotheticals, would the you that he imagines be self-aware? I mean, if he thinks about you perfectly, that would include all aspects of your mind too. So, could all the pain and suffering in this universe be nothing more than a counterfactual that God imagined strictly as an example of what he is not going to actualize? But, because God thought of it, and because he thinks perfectly, is it inevitable that if God God is to imagine the existence of evil in a counterfactual universe, that the universe he imagines necessarily endures that imagined evil. Would that still give rise to the problem of evil, or would it mean that evil is necessary because it's impossible not to think of counterfactuals and a being that can think perfectly would, through no ill intent, think of those worlds to avoid creating them? You may think these questions are absurd to contemplate, but honestly, that's not really that much different from asking if a computer simulation can have self-aware minds inside of it, and you program it to come up with all kinds of variations before selecting the optimal one to mass produce. If you did that, would you be evil for creating hypothetical minds that you later deleted, even though they were never intended to be in the final release? If not, would God be evil if this is a universe he has decided not to instantiate and you only exist for a brief time, self-aware as we are, while he considers whether to instantiate it before he decides it's not worth it. In other words, if you found out that you do not actually exist in a physical space, would you consider anything done to you to still be an injustice, when you know that the only things that really happened to you were illusions, and they only ever felt real because you believed they were? Consider the train of thought useful or not. That's up to you. But if you aren't a dualist, you're going to need to wrestle with the implications, because I think it's clear that computers are already sufficiently advanced that they are at least on the level of lower insects. And if you think it's possible insects feel pain, then you need to understand whether you have a moral obligation to ensure computer intelligence doesn't feel pain, or you can become a dualist like me. There are always options. And with that, have a wonderful day, or, you know, don't. As I said, there are always options.